well uh, dear friends uh, welcome uh, to the uh, second talk of the series uh, which uh, the aligarh society of history and archaeology asha and ganga jamni foundation is holding as announced last week before diversifying and taking up other themes uh we had said that we will in the first few months uh devote our attention towards an understanding uh of three great sons uh of india who stood for unity in diversity and a shared culture i mean gandhi ji sir syed ahmed khan and emperor akbar last week we had a discussion on akbar today we will have a talk on sir syed ahmed khan whose 204th centenary we celebrated on 17th october this year how do we assess him today after the passing of two centuries which separate us from him 19th century was very different from the period we live today sir sayyad responded to the challenges of his times and manners which suited that period the thought processes and ideals of those days were uh, uh also quite different so the question is is sir sayyed and his thoughts still relevant for us today related question is if sir sayyed is still relevant is he relevant only for those who are at aligarh or is he relevant for the general indians as well to discuss this issue that how we should appraise sir sayyed ahmed khan in today's world we have with me professor asim siddiqui a former student as well as a professor of english at aligarh muslim university the institution which was founded by sir sayyed ahmed khan asim saab had been in our program before as well in the previous season of our lecture series he had talked to us on literature as a window for his being a man of literature he has worked upon among other things literary theory 19 19th and 20th century english and arab american fiction south asian literature film studies so on and so forth he has a monograph on shahriyar published in this very year 2021 which was published by the sahitya academy in the makers of indian literature series he has also been a full bright fellow at new york university in 2007 apart from his academic contributions Dr Siddiqui has also been writing for different newspapers and magazines and news portals like the Guardian the Hindu Hindustan Times Statesman readif.com scroll.in ndtv frontline india today etc etc 
His critical reviews of books on literature have also appeared in journals like the Book Review, Biblio, and other such publications. He also, uh, he also has done much work as far as translating certain works from Urdu and Hindi are concerned into English. He is also the managing editor of the Urdu translation uh, of complete works of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, a project of Dr. Ambedkar Foundation, Ministry of Social Justice. Recently, he was involved in the publication of two coffee table books, one on AMU on its first centenary and another earlier than that on the occasion of Sir Syed Ahmad Khan's bicentennial, uh, bicentennial year uh, a couple of weeks, uh, of, of years ago. Presently, he is also hosting a fortnightly program in Urdu on English, on English books, on Urdu literature and language for Anjuman Tarakiya Urdu Hin. Let me now request my friend, Dr. Asim Siddiqui, Professor of, his, uh, of English, to deliver his talk on appraising Sir Sayyid in the 21st century. Over to you, uh, Asim. Thank you very much, uh, Nadim Bhai. And thank you very much, uh, Ganga Jamni Foundation, for uh, organizing uh, this wonderful series. It was a pleasure being part of this series uh, last year in its first season. And this season also, I am very eagerly waiting for many such important sessions. Nadim Saab very rightly pointed out certain uh, very interesting things in his opening remarks that Sir Syed Ahmad Khan is a very important name as far as India's cultural heritage is concerned. He also warned us against a certain tendency. And that is, we must not forget that Sir Syed Ahmad Khan was writing in 19th century. That means uh, the time he was writing, the time he was living, that was very different. But Nazim Sahib, has also pointed out that there is uh, something in him or something in our past heroes which is relevant and how we take some of those lessons, how we interpret some of those ideas and how we find relevance for some of the ideas of some of our past icons in our present times. So that is, I think, uh, a wonderful uh, opening for this talk also. How do we see a man like Sir Syed Ahmad Khan, who lived his life in 19th century, who was operating in 19th century context, who was living at a time when British imperialism was at its peak. So with the, these opening remarks, if I just uh, make some initial observations about Sir Syed Ahmad Khan for those who may not know enough about his life and about his work. It is really remarkable to know a person who has so many different dimensions, who has so many different aspects. Now, what are those different dimensions? We know that he is a found, he's the founder of Aligarh Muslim University. That means that is one very important role. And when Aligarh Muslim University started its journey as a school in 1875, and then of course, uh, two years later as Mohammedan Anglo Oriental College, it was a very important moment in the history of India's education and in the history of uh, Muslims' education in India. So that means that is very important role and it has been discussed threadbare. And every year, Ali, Ali celebrate uh, uh, Sir Syed Ahmad Khan's role as an educationist. But there are other important dimensions of Sir Syed Ahmad Khan. One very important dimension, which uh, is especially important for the present audience, that we can also call him a pioneer in the history of archaeology in India. There are not many works of that kind at that time. And that is why 
Sir Syed Ahmed Khan's work on some old monuments of Delhi becomes so important at this time because there he was influenced by, or rather, he took very positive lessons from uh, British historiography, and he was able to talk about some very important monuments first, describing them, and then also using what today we can call uh, methods of semiotics or visual visual method methodology there he also talked about those monuments in great detail so that is another important book dimension of sir Syed. he was also a great collector of artifacts and uh, here also we can see that uh, at that time we did not have uh, this concept of museum that we have today but at that time he was a great collector and some of those uh, rare artifacts that he collected can be seen in uh, Adigal Muslim University and Nadeem Saab has also done wonderful work in that regard how he collected some of those artifacts and what is their value how we learn some important lessons of history from those artifacts so that is yet another important role we can also know something about Sir Sayyid's role as far as uh, editing of books is concerned. We know that he edited uh, Aini Akbari. He also edited another very important book, Tariq Efroz Chai. And what is involved in the act of editing? How we must pay very close attention to different editions of a book, to different manuscripts. We must pay close attention to the spelling of words, meaning of those words. That means all this fine job of editing, all those nuances about editing, which even today's editors find difficult to handle, you can see in the work of Sir Syed Ahmed Khan. So that is yet another important role. And another important role that uh, we can identify Sir Syed Ahmed Khan is, is he is probably also a pioneer of public service journalism in India. And he is also a pioneer in Urdu journalism. And he is also a pioneer of Urdu prose. We often talk about uh, Ghalib and uh, Ghalib's modernism and especially a certain kind of modernist uh, poetics and modernist outlook in Mirza Asadullah Khan Ghalib. But if we talk about prose, then that role probably belongs to Sir Syed Ahmed Khan, how he could write prose which was very clear, which was explicit, which was free from frills. And that way he was able to call a speed a speed because he could use that kind of prose without uh, say caring too much about uh, flowery language without caring too much about using metaphors otherwise you can talk about a direct kind of prose so and we know that that direct kind of prose is so important for journalism also and if i can draw a parallel here then uh, somebody like ernest hemingway who had a very important experience as a war correspondent. Later, when he started writing novels, something of that kind of transparent prose is also very much part of his style in his novels. So, Sayyid Khan is also a pioneer as far as Urdu prose is concerned. He launched newspaper, he launched some publications, and we know that uh, Ali, the Aligarh Institute Gazette and Tazibul Akhlaq. These are two very important publications, and these two publications are still continuing. One very important role that these publications played at that time was they also tried to talk about some grievances of the people. That means if people had some grievances, then those grievances were also aired through these publications. So here you also have this beginning of uh, public service journalism. So this is an important role. And if we talk about some other roles of Sir Syed Ahmed Khan, then he was also a great observer of life. He was also a great traveler. And if I talk about one very important book of Sir Syed Ahmed Khan, when he traveled to London, he saw life very closely in London. That book also gives you some very interesting ideas how Sir Syed Ahmed Khan could employ certain methods of ethnography. Today, we are we students of social sciences use methods of ethnography. So there you can see that Sir Syed Ahmed Khan, in fact, is using some of those methods. He stayed there. He, he spent some time with people there. And he observes life also there. 
in fact not only that in ethnography we also sometimes talk about uh, multi local ethnography that means uh, we are not talking about one place but rather we are talking about different places and there is also another interesting branch of ethnography that is indigenous ethnography so it is not simply england but uh, as he started his journey he, he spent some time in bombay and uh, if he talks about some of those uh, people then that is also an important aspect of his ethnographic method so here we see that sir sayed ahmed khan appears in different roles but uh, i would like to focus on some other important aspects of sir sayed ahmed khan work and that important aspect is his uh, reliance on reason his emphasis on tolerance because these are two very important words two important key words that uh, i would like to further dwell upon in the next half an hour reason and the second important word is tolerance if i can bring one very important thinker of 20th century edward said edward said knew two different worlds very closely he knew the western world he knew he spent his time at columbia university he is taught there he had a career there and he knew united states of america very closely but edward said also belonged to a different world which in fact was lost in a way he also belonged to a world which in fact disintegrated from the map of the world he talked about a kind of scholarship which he called humanist scholarship and it is in one of his later works humanism and democratic criticism there he talks about the values of humanist scholarship and it is important to mention this work because at this time scholarship in literature scholarship in literary criticism was moving away from humanism so at this time uh, edward said was talking about a humanist scholarship and there he talked about a scholar who is both an insider as well as an outsider to the ideas that he confronts that means he is both an insider but at the same time he is also an outsider to those ideas that means he offers the virtue of reception but he also is ready for resistance he has the virtue of belonging but he also has the virtue of detachment so if we see these uh, binaries where we have the element of belonging and we also have the element of detachment we have the element of reception and we also have the element of resistance we are the insider and we are the outsider i think uh, this very beautifully sums up sir sayed ahmed khan's work also when he confronts many of those english ideas so he looks at those ideas as an outsider but when he looks at some of the ideas which are current in his time or some of those ideas belonging to his society he is able to see them both as an outsider as well as an insider this outsider status is coming from his exposure to the ideas which were ascendant in his time so that way he was both an insider and outsider to all those ideas that he confronted now coming back to these two very important words reason and tolerance i'll say that uh, if we analyze sir sayed ahmed khan's life all through he appears a very strong votary of reason one important uh, quality about a man of reason is that when confronted with a very sound evidence he or she is also able to change his ideas that is one very important thing and another dimension of reason is pragmatism in some respects sometimes pragmatism can be a kind of eclis heel pragmatism can be not really a virtue pragmatism can probably stop you from doing certain things which may be considered radical but which are necessary so that's why we often say that sir sayed ahmed khan was a great thinker reformer but he was not a prophet he had his blind spots and we'll come to those things later 
Now, when we come to this particular question of reason, here, if we trace his career, we know that one very important moment in Sir Syed Ahmad Khan's life was 1857. That means the revolt of 1857. Sir Syed Ahmad Khan before 1857 was a very different person and Sir Syed Ahmad Khan after 1857 was a changed person in many different ways. And there was a change in his uh, political outlook also and there was also a change in his perception of the needs of the people that he wanted to serve. And at this point, he, you can say that uh, he sided with the British during the revolt of the 1857, but he was not alone. There were many. And uh, at this time, it is very easy to say, criticize him, but that was probably the role that was played by lots of people. After this, we can also talk about one very important work that he wrote at this time. And historians would talk about this work uh, probably with greater clarity. But if we talk about uh, his work, Causes of uh, Indian Revolt or Azbabe Bhagavate Hin, then from a certain perspective, this work appears to be a very brave work, bold work, because he was talking about the reasons why people were dissatisfied with the British rule. In other words, he was telling the British that these were the reasons why this revolt happened. Now, some of those reasons may appear very, very conservative to say. Some of those reasons may surprise us today also. But here I want to highlight this, this one fact that he was able to talk to the English masters. He was able to talk to the English rather than maintaining silence. He decided to take this risk. And that's why this is an important work. I'm not a student of history, but I was uh, a student of history in my undergraduate days. And I remember reading Bipin Chandra's Modern India, where uh, uh, we see that uh, his work has been quoted number of times in the chapter on the, the revolt of 1857. Now, if we leave this work behind and we talk about one very important development which took place after this, that was uh, the publication of one very important book by Sir William Muir. And this book was titled Life of Muhammad. This book came out in 1861. That means uh, just uh, four years after the revolt of 1857. This work appeared actually in four volumes. It's a very comprehensive work. And uh, if we read this work very closely, we'll find that uh, it's a good read. It uh, bases its arguments on four important things. It talks about uh, Quran. It talks about traditions. It talks about uh, Arab poetry and it talks about some contemporary sources. When this work appeared, it created a lot of controversy. And the reason for that controversy was that uh, William Muir had talked about the prophet of Islam. He had and he had presented the prophet in a negative light. And he had also questioned some very important beliefs which are very dear to all. Muslims. One such belief is the concept of revelation. So that was an important thing. When this book appeared, naturally there was discussion of this book in the vernacular, vernacular press and uh, many people were outraged. When I was probing this issue, something really vexed me, perplexed me and that issue was how did Sir Syed Ahmad Khan know about the contents of this book? How did Sir Syed Ahmad Khan know about the contents of this book? Because Sir Syed Ahmad Khan did not know English or at any rate he knew very, he did not have a very good command of English language. Probably he could read 
English newspapers could understand little bit of those newspapers. But as far as his knowledge of English language is concerned, it was uh, uh, not that which we expect of uh, a person who has command of language. So naturally, its uh, discussion must have appeared, the discussion of this book must have appeared in the vernacular press. And its extracts in translation must have appeared. But in any case, since there was controversy about this book, so Sir Syed Ahmad Khan was really outraged by that. But again, there is one historical fact which needs to be proved further. Sir Syed Ahmad Khan visited England in 1869 and 1870. Now, often the reason given for this is that he wanted to write a rejoinder to William Muir's work. Of course, Sir Syed Ahmad Khan had gone to England because his son had got his scholarship and uh, Sir Syed Ahmad Khan had accompanied his son there. But important thing here is that for about uh, uh, eight or nine years, this issue of writing a rejoinder was very much there in his mind. So that means when he finally undertook that journey, he decided to write a rejoinder to William Moore's book. Now the point here that is important at this time is, and the point which is important in our 21st century context is that Sir Syed Ahmad Khan is not talking about banning that book. He is not talking about uh, staging uh, demonstrations against that book. He is not making a call for burning that book. No, rather he is taking a very, very difficult route. And that difficult route is writing a rejoinder to a book. That is one very important thing. In fact, uh, it, it is not the only occasion when Sir Syed Ahmad Khan took to this particular route. When another book, and that is uh, Hunter's book, which is a very famous book where uh, after the revolt of 1857, he made some charges against uh, Muslims and he how he tried to establish that uh, Muslims uh, somehow have uh, something against uh, the English rule that they cannot be loyal to English rule. In fact, uh, in 21st century context, Hunter's book should be read anyway uh, in a different context. But thing is that uh, Sir Syed Ahmad Khan at that time decided to write a rejoinder. Why am I emphasizing this point is that writing a rejoinder requires a lot of hard work. It requires a lot of research work. It requires a lot of labor. Burning a book requires no effort. So that for one can agree or disagree with his rejoinder. One can probably disagree with his arguments, but one must appreciate his very modernist method of entering a debate, his very modernist method of refutation. That means ideas should be countered with ideas. Book should be countered with a book. A rejoinder should be written with a lot of diligence and hard work. Similarly, it is, and there is another occasion also when Sir Syed Ahmad Khan actually wrote a petition also to the government. And it was in reference to one particular textbook which uh, created some controversy. So when he wrote a petition to the government earlier, there also he was just uh, showing us a method. And the method was either you write to the authorities in today's context, that means uh, you seek a kind of legal route or you write a rejoinder. Both are very educated means of lodging your protest. Either you seek help from the courts, you lodge a case, or for that matter, you write a rejoinder. So when Sir Syed Ahmad Khan reached England, and from there, he has also written some letters. He has written some letters, and there he reveals this important fact that uh, his mind was occupied with this idea. He was also thinking about this whole issue that how 
he would face his uh, ancestor and he's talking about uh, the prophet how he would face him if he did not respond to william muir's book and he also asked his uh, friends in delhi to sell some of the utensils to sell some of the articles at his home at his home so that he could buy some books that means he spent he is spending money from his pocket so that he could buy books so that he could uh, also pay to translators when he translated when that particular work was written so finally he was able to write a rejoinder he wrote that rejoinder in urdu but it was published first in english now here also i draw an interesting lesson from this when he writes that rejoinder he also enters a very say interesting method of debate he praises he praises william muir very highly he talks about many other important biographers of uh, prophet he talks about uh, gibbon also he talks about davenport also and he praises he praises uh, william muir but later he we, we would see that he also uses uh, some evaluative kind of vocabulary and he reveals some flaws in the work of william muir william muir had made some very nasty remarks also we can say see for example one such remark was that uh, somehow he implied that uh, the prophet had written that book he had also implied that uh, the prophet uh, was very vindictive he had also implied written that the the prophet laughed very immoderately in other in other words there were some nasty remarks on the prophet so sir sayed ahmed khan looks up this issue looks at this issue in a very very reasonable manner and one such method of attack was he tried to show the weakness of the sources which william muir used one very important source that william muir used and william muir used in fact uh, all those uh, arab sources in his book and sir sayed ahmed khan also talked about one source which william muir used frequently in his book and that was a reference to al waqidi sir sayed ahmed khan in fact agrees with william muir that it is very important that the authenticity of hadith must be scrutinized but then when he looks at william muir's sources and he looks at the work of al waqidi he says that all scholars all sound scholars all serious scholars agree that al waqidi is the weakest of all sources in islamic history and once he attacks one very important source that william muir used he was ready to he was uh, ready to demolish that argument of william muir he was trying to show the weakness in his argument then furthermore he also uses sometimes some uh, words like william muir's fertile imagination william muir's fertile imagination or his exaggerations or his prejudices in other words sometimes not saying too much but simply by employing an evaluative vocabulary he is able to show his disagreement at the end of the day when he talked about his book when he published this book there was no acrimony as such between him and william muir so that means later he was able to resume his uh, friendship or his relationship with with william muir probably this is also one very important lesson which we can learn from sir sayed ahmed khan we often disagree with others but as long as uh, our uh, debate is civilized probably there is no reason why there cannot be that kind of relationship which existed before the debate he also tries to point out the flaws in william muir's intention and he says that william muir wrote that book because he was asked by c pfender to write that book and pfender 
was a missionary. That means from the very beginning when William Muir undertook that work, it was at the instance of a missionary. And so the intentions of a missionary was were very, very important in the conception of that work. Now, one question arises here. How did Sir Syed Ahmed Khan come to this very modernist method of debate? What are the factors which go into the making of this kind of mind in 19th century? We know that he had a very traditional education. So there is nothing in his background. But uh, he was also a very curious person. He was a man of curiosity that way. And he was also a very deeply read man. We can say that uh, he was familiar with uh, Ibn Rushd. He was familiar with Mutazilite philosophy. And somewhere this uh, blending of reason and religion or bringing reason into a discussion of religion was not something bad for him. Although for many people, for many of his conservative friends, it was not a good thing to bring reason into a discussion of religion. In fact, even today, and again, I'm emphasizing this point, even today, if you discuss with devout uh, people, with people who are uh, very, very devout Muslims or devout Hindus or devout Christians, it becomes very difficult to bring reason into debate. So Sir Siyad Khan, we probably learned this re lesson from him. So probably this influence from Mutazilite philosophy, this influence from uh, Ibn Rushd. But another important thing is that at that time, we also had many of these Western ideas, which uh, were very, very common. Sir Siyad Ahmed Khan did not know English, but certainly many of those ideas were in the air. And again, this is uh, a point which has to be verified through different sources. But the, this point is often made that Sir Syed Ahmed Khan was deeply influenced by 18th century philosophy, 18th century rationalism. Not in all respects, but certainly in matters of religion, Sir Syed Ahmed Khan appears very close to certain ideas in 18th century England. There is uh, something of a deist in Sir Syed Ahmed Khan, something of a deist. And that is also reflected in his tafsir, which he would write later. And we know that he wrote his tafsir in 1891. And before that also, he had been talking about uh, many ideas which appear very radical even today because he was bringing in reason in in his discussion of religion so he could speak against angels he could speak against miracles he could speak against uh, many of those things which people commonly believe because somehow his rational mind did not accept the existence of miracles or the existence of angels Similarly, and there is also one very important line in um, Islamic, inter Islamic interpretation of Quran. That line is that we have to see certain aspects of scriptures metaphorically. So that is also one view that whether you view something literally or whether you view that thing metaphor metaphorically also. And here he came up with one very important dictum. And it was a matter of conviction for him. And that dictum was, that credo was his, his belief in the harmony between the work of God and the word of God. So on the one hand, there is the word of God. And on the other hand, you also had the work of God. That means there is nothing in Islam in his view, which should be against the laws of nature. So it is a very, very important jump as far as, uh, say, 
matter of religion is concerned because even today we do not talk in this vein and even today this remark can arouse some controversy so this work of god in the word of god we see that uh, this is a very important aspect of his work and we can see this reliance on reason in all his works now the second important aspect which i mentioned a while ago and that important uh, aspect is his reliance on the virtue of tolerance when he started his college the doors of the college were open to everyone and he has repeatedly made many speeches and some of his famous speeches where he has talked about uh, this virtue of tolerance he has also talked about uh, different customs in india he has also talked about uh, his uh, view of ancient indian culture how he takes pride in that fact and how he also speaks against bigotry he speaks against flattery if we read the pages of tazibul aflaq and if we read the pages of the legal institute gazette we will find number of examples where uh, sir syed ahmed khan appears a very very tolerant person and here tolerance is a very important virtue here he practiced it in his real life also and if we have a view of his friends he had friends from different sections of society he had many friends close friends he always had this relationship with his hindu friends and of course with others also in fact uh, some people he had differences with whether uh, it is shibli or it is samiullah there also you will see that uh, somehow we never uh, let go this virtue of tolerance there are number of his speeches there are in fact there are one or two speeches which can be considered some bad speeches but since we are talking about the corpus the entire corpus of a person we are talking about all possible works of one person and we are talking about the entire canon of sir syed ahmed khan so naturally there is a lot in his work which needs to be celebrated certainly there are some blind spots we can mention some of those things today in passing this is uh, uh, not the time in fact uh, to discuss those things in great detail if we talk about his views on female education we cannot uh, celebrate him on this count but we cannot uh, demonize him on this count either because he was not against the idea of female education he was not against the idea of education of women but because uh, he held certain very strange views about women's education he believed in uh, say tutor based home education for women so he was not denying this fact but one important thing is that uh, many of his ideas in fact paved the way for uh, later developments to take place similarly his uh, much publicized hostility against indian national congress also has to be seen in some perspective we know that uh, he also made some disparaging remarks against bengalis he also made some bad remarks against some social groups right we cannot uh, uh, probably hold a brief for those remarks but uh, and here uh, i am bringing in iftahar alam khan who has written number of important books on sir syed ahmed khan i agree with his view that if sir syed ahmed khan had lived maybe longer maybe a decade or so then probably he could well have joined indian national congress because when he made those statements against indian national congress it was still early days and he was talking about he was greatly worried about his college he was greatly worried for his student he was greatly worried for the cause which was very dear to him but uh, this particular stance was not a communal stance this particular stance was not a sectarian stance rather it had its uh, origin 
in his care for his college because there were many others also belonging to his class belonging to his feudal background they were also opposed to indian national congress so at that time it was not a test of patriotism and of course indian national movement will gain momentum a few decades later and we know that uh, even uh, students of aligarh mu college they also were greatly inspired by some of those nationalist ideas so what we can say here is that uh, maybe if he had survived a decade or so he could well have become very close to indian national congress because he was always he was also changing his positions there was uh, a time in his uh, early years when he believed that uh, earth he believed this view that uh, earth was stationary right and later he was able to change this belief that means uh, this idea of rotation of earth later he was able to change this belief also that means uh, he did not have that kind of dogmatic mind so here we have a man of very strong convictions a man who was able to change his views if he was convinced and if better evidence suggested itself a man who greatly valued the quality of reason who greatly valued the well, the quality of tolerance and of course a man who knew how to enter a debate using very modernist methods enough has been said about sir sayed and khan's modernity so probably these are some important thing which i wanted to highlight and of course i uh, just go back to that important point that there are so many different aspects of sir sayed ahmed khan's personality so many different aspects just lastly one point and this is meant this is uh, again uh, a lesser known uh, aspect of sir sayed ahmed khan you know that when he started uh, publishing his journals when he start when he launched his newspaper at that time there was the use of uh, lithographic print and that appeared very very bad so what did sir sayed ahmed khan do he preferred movable type so this was a revolution in uh, urdu journalism when he turned to movable type so that means he was ready to adopt that technology which change the face of urdu journalism similarly and uh, here uh, in fact uh, i am speaking for many of the readers who are like me who are not as proficient in reading old texts of urdu as probably we can some modern computer type texts of urdu sir sayed ahmed khan also introduced punctuation marks in urdu and we know that how sometime lack of punctuation marks in urdu prose can befell us and he knew that punctuation is important in urdu prose so he introduced punctuation marks at that time and he was a pioneer in urdu prose in that respect also so here we have a man who had many dimensions many aspects probably each of his aspects requires a session but maybe i must stop here and if there are some questions i would come back to those questions thank you uh, thank you asim uh, for a uh, very brilliant uh, presentation of uh, sir sayed ahmed khan's relevance in today's world uh, you know uh, as all of us know that uh, Sir Syed Ahmed Khan actually uh, during the 20th century and then ultimately during the 21st century is a very controversial person. The controversy uh, does not limit itself only to the Hindu Tua Post. Uh, there is a large section of the Muslims also. in fact i will say two sections of the muslims one who accuse him 
and second to attribute to him something which probably the poor man never knew about. <laughs> and the end result is that Sir Sayyid uh, today is supposed to be an anti-national. A person who has been appropriated by our neighbors in Pakistan. So, in a way, uh, the type of, uh, you know, uh, things which you told us about Sir Sayyid are quite relevant and are things which possibly the general persons could know about Sir Sayyid Ahmad. Uh, as you rightly pointed out, that in the institution which was set up by Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, the Mohammedan Anglo Oriental College, not only contributions from all communities were taken, uh, it's not only us who are talking about it, but uh, we have evidence. In fact, the very walls of the structures and buildings created by Sir Sayyid contain the names of those donors and the large number of those donors were non-Muslims. They were Christian. There was Amidas. They were members of the elite society. They were prostitutes. They were workers. All type of people were tapped by Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan at a time when he was building his organization. And when ultimately the college started, once again we find that uh, during the lifetime of Sir Sayyid himself, there were a number of, in fact, I, I should say, a large number of students in those short years when Sasiyat was alive were non Muslim. It is not that they were applying and there was no way out to cut them off. Today, we look at this and think that the cut off list is cut off, so many of them are cut No. He was writing letters to the fathers of these boys to send their sons to his college, MAO college. So, I mean, these are the facts which should be brought up, uh, brought up. You rightly pointed out that when Sir Sayyid was looking at the things, whether political or social, he had two, he was looking at them from two viewpoints as an outsider and as an insider. Unfortunately, although Sir Sayyid took great care that he should appear to be civil, both his attempts at looking at things as an outsider and looking at things, being critical of things as an insider both have now unfortunately made him controversial. Uh, I also believe before I take up questions uh, from the public, uh, there are a number of questions. I also have certain, uh, not questions, but uh, you know, comments which I have to make. But, uh, you know, uh, Sasayyab has to be revisited by us again and again. Not as the person who tried to counter William Muir for writing a compilation. But as you rightly pointed out, he should be celebrated for the fact that he employed that method 
during the this 21st century when even a slight you know suspicion that our religion has been commented upon we start burning posters burning offices as well as lynching prasayat never ever thought of employing any of those methods you rightly pointed out that sasayat uh, his hands were i would say his hands were tied as far as his english was concerned i don't believe that he would not have been able to read after all he had been serving the uh, english for long he had been a servant of the english east india company before the revolt of 1857 and then he continued to serve the british crown after the english east india company was done away with after mutiny when the british crown became the our uh, direct rulers for cet even at that time continue for a long period possibly he was getting his works translated because uh, uh, there is uh, possibly uh, no other uh, i mean uh, reason why uh, his own book uh, appears to be very cogent and a point to point rebuttal of newer's work when i as you right you pointed out one may agree with sir sayed's point of view or not but it's very much there um well uh, i'm sorry uh, but uh, you know Uh, there are so many aspects of sir sayed uh, which have to be highlighted and i am really thankful to you that today you highlighted certain of that facts which his alma mater his own creation somehow forgets to talk about uh, uh, you rightly pointed out we have a museum but it's a musa dakhri museum even the name of sir sayed is not there the main gallery of that museum is devoted to the collections made by sir sayed ahmed khan himself and in this 21st century when there are attempts being made to divide us versus them our authorities should have highlighted that a room full gallery uh, has sculptures has materials from the temples the only material from the muslim past is a single slab that too when it was on the verge of being lost sir sayed collected it and brought it as it's a music museum one more thing which i would like to appreciate of your talk is that you pointed out that sir sayed was a collector i just pointed out the type of collection which he was making which we should have highlighted but more than that at a time when the concept of museum was not very popular mm. in the you know uh, campus which he was visualizing just between the stretching hall from where he would deliver his speeches to the form between that structure and the jama masjid 
was a building which was made by sir sayed himself nizam museum so he established a museum at a time when we were not even aware of the fact that these these ye jo hamari national heritage hai ye dharohar hai inko hame hifazat karna chahiye when did the uh, sir sayed ahmed khan collect all of these material at a time when he was busy establishing his college hmm. whenever he would get time he would then survey the area and collect all this material he was not concerned ke isme kaun hindu hai kaun buddhist hai kaun jain hai hmm. kaun muslim hai no the other work which you pointed out asaru sanadi the work dealing with monuments of delhi did sir sayed ahmed khan discriminate between monuments of the hindu past and the muslim past he collected all you rightly pointed out that being a person trained in the persian tradition in the mughal court sir sayed knew persian and arabic he was not very very comfortable in english and definitely he did not know the indian languages whether it was sanskrit or the scripts of the indian languages apart from the arabic script but do, what do we find in asaru sanadi all those epigraphs all those inscriptions which were there in nagari written in sanskrit or other languages which the poor man could not understand or comprehend he did not leave them out he copied them in toto some of those inscriptions of the siddiqui in asarunadi uh they are those which now have actually disappeared and the only source and they they their opinion is so authentic without knowing the script that scholars have deciphered so there was a man who was talking about the glorious past not of the muslims not of the hindus but of him so the relevance of the sayyid today for us is this fact he his memory can act as a balm for the vitiated atmosphere which we are experiencing through the last so many years uh, uh, with these brief uh, you know uh, comments i would now uh, want you to answer some of the questions which have been asked one of the questions uh, which has been asked is uh, a question which was asked even prior or starting the lecture was where are the descendants of sir sayed ahmed khan are they in india do they exist where are they are this is a question which was asked by vikar i think nadeem hey, we know uh, one lady uh, i'm forgetting her name but uh, she often comes here uh, you but uh, i don't know whether she is living in india or she is uh, abroad you must have met her uh, um, i'm forgetting her name uh, i i i gave this question because i also forgot her name hmm uh, but the fact uh, vikas artist that, uh, name begins with say sh some shares are some uh, something i mean the 
Yeah, I'm just, yeah, I'm yeah. forgetting the name. Yes. Yeah. But the fact remains that uh, uh, you know, Vakar Sahab, there are a number of relatives of the family uh, which survive. Some of them are in India, distant relatives, but the closer relatives of Sir Syed Ahmad Khan today are in Pakistan. Some of them are also settled in UK. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, we do not know. I mean, Jaisa ke Mughalo ke Rishidari mein hota hai ke har du saad mein khade ho ke claim karta hai ke we are the relatives. Is pe se kitne direct vaqi relatives hain Sir Syed Ahmad Khan ke. Uh, that aspect is something which I think uh, really be worked at. But there are certain uh, uh, relatives which survive. There is a question by Ali Heather. Uh, Ali Heather Saab asks, uh, 19th century was an era in which reformist movements in Muslim world like Tanzima uh, reforms in Turkey, Nahda movement in Arab world, Jadid movement in Russia came to exist. Do we have any evidence of these movements having any influence on Sir Sayyid's Aligarh movement? Did he ever uh, make yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, I believe that, uh, sir, and th again, this is also a very important point which uh, probably is relevant in our context. Sir Syed Ahmad Khan was not thinking about global Muslim identity. And this is a very important point. Sir Syed Ahmad Khan was not drawn by the idea of pan-Islamism. So today, for example, we often see that a kind of global Muslim identity is imposed on just anyone. So that way, at that time, you are right that there were many such movements. And uh, we can also see relationship between Sir Sayyid's ideas and uh, say, for example, Muhammad Abdu's ideas at some level. But as far as Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan's specific concerns are concerned, he was addressing Indian Muslims. He was addressing Indians, whether uh, as a member of Imperial Legislative Council, and he was thinking as an Indian, he was uh, talking about eradicating uh, uh, smallpox or making efforts to, mail, to make railways a comfortable place. That means all public good things. And when he talked about Muslims, his specific concern was Indian Muslims. So here uh, I'll say that uh, he was uh, not uh, drawn to this idea of global Muslim identity. And this is a relevant point today also. Ali Haider Sahib, uh, I would just add to what uh, Professor Siddiqui has said. Remember that even during our present times, at a time when there is so much under, under Muslim fundamentalism and terrorism, uh, we know that the Indian Muslims remained uh, aloof of all that. So, Sir Sayyid Se Leke Ashtak. Indian Muslims they have make entity and they have remained confined to themselves. Sir Sayyid nowhere he invokes a lot of things, uh, but um, yes he was uh, aware of uh, some of those movements which yes. was taking place, but nowhere in his works like Asbab or for example in his book on Bijnor. Hmm. Uh, as Baab e Sarkashi e Hind Bijnor, nowhere does he refer or seems to be influenced by any of those people. Yes. Hmm. So, ye, uh, it was unlike uh, what uh, we find in uh, Allama Iqbal, for example. He's yes, talking, yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, he is so much influenced by whatever is happening, out, happening outside. But Sayyad is looking, looking only in words yeah, and nowhere else. Uh, there is a question by Mirza Hasnain. 
Sir Sayyid contributed greatly to learning English and to rationalism. Do we know who, uh, uh, who were his favorite English poets, novelists, and dramatists? And did he believe in Darwinian theory of evolution? Can you also tell what was Mohammedan educational conference? Did it have any All India? It did it uh, had All India? In Fact, yes, number. very. Uh, let me just address first part of the question first, and of course, uh, Nadine Saab uh, would talk about the second. But uh, you have already mentioned uh, English rationalism. Okay, uh, again, I must say that uh, here uh, this relationship of Sir Syed Ahmed Khan and English rationalism is not properly worked out. There is just uh, it is a matter of conjecture, but because those ideas were very much part of ethos at that time, they were very ascendant. So maybe Sir Sayyid learned something from those ideas. But as far as uh, say English poets, novelists or dramatists are concerned, he did talk about uh, some important uh, uh, say aspects of English poetry. Say, for example, uh, he was addressing many Urdu poets when he said that uh, uh, Indian writers or Indian poets or Urdu poets, they must also bring in nature in their work. Because you know that in English poetry, nature is a very important element. Nature was a very important element in romantic poetry. And although uh, a lot of Victorian poetry had a different style, but still nature is a very important part of English poetry as such. So he was talking about uh, English poetry. He was talking about lack of frills in English poetry and exhorting poets to use nature. Mm -hmm. And also there uh, something of that style, which uh, was part of English style. He wanted that to be part of uh, Urdu poetry also. And you know that uh, he exerted an influence on uh, some important writers, let's say, for example, uh, Dipti Nazir Ahmed and many others also. Although in 20th century, we'll know that, of course, uh, what Hali was talking about, a kind of modernist poetics, Hali was also speaking against classical notions of ghazal that how there are only certain paradigms, certain uh, patterns in ghazals. And Hali also wanted classical ghazal to move away from that tradition and to embrace ideas of nature, which were there in English poetry. So that way, uh, we cannot say that Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan had any specific English poet who was his favorite. But in general, he was happy with a certain style of poetry. He did meet uh, Charles Dickens when he went, uh, when he was there in England, he met Charles Dickens. But I don't think uh, he read Charles Dickens. Right. As far as uh, the second part of your question is concerned, Mohammedan Educational Congress. Yes, it did have that kind of all India influence. He, But it had that influence later. And again, and uh, it is uh, again a very important aspect of this, that after Sir Syed Ahmed Khan's death, only a few years after his death, Muslim Educational Conference, in fact, degenerated into many, into certain things. And uh, But during his lifetime, it was a po very, very positive kind of presence. Because if you see the role of Mohsin al-Mulk, who was a very close associate of Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan. Recently, Iftikhar Ahmad Khan has written a very interesting book. He was he handed me a copy of this book. And he has also talked about the role of Mohsin al-Mulk. So that does not appear to be a very, very uh, positive role in many different ways. Because if you look at, uh, um, say, Dhaka, Revolution, those things. So their Muslim mulk also was uh, part of that. But during Sir Syed Ahmed Khan's time, uh, Muslim Educational Conference had a very different role. Nadim Saab would add something probably. Uh, I will add to uh, 
the uh, what i believe are the uh, you know resources for rationalism which uh, sayed believed in. Uh, but before that are there any other questions uh, shagurta are there any questions well uh, uh, ha there is one uh, what was uh, sir sayed's contribution to pasmanda musliman and ajlaf category of muslims was he against education of lower class of muslims here uh, i'll just mention one or two remarks that he made against some lower sections of muslims say when he was talking about the revolt of 1857 and they are not good remarks and here we must understand this very important fact that sir sayed ahmed khan also was a man of his class so in many ways he moved away from his uh, feudal background moved away from his feudal class but maybe something of that was responsible for many of those remarks but when actually he started this college first as first the school and then the college then there was absolutely no discrimination on the basis of one's class or on the basis of one's creed but uh, there is one reason because uh, sir sayed ahmed khan employed and his son uh, sayed mahmud also was part of that they employed some excellent teachers some excellent teachers who studied at cambridge many people who had studied at cambridge and many people in fact who came from england they stayed here for some time and one very important thing is and that many of these people were very distinguished people by any standard and here also i take two points from this i am a student of uh, literature english literature sir walter rally sir walter rally worked here he was employed by sayed mahmud he was employed by sayed mahmud he was here for 3 years and sir walter rally later became a professor when the chair was introduced there in oxford first chair of english first professor so that means sir sayed ahmed khan was able to see his promise here and there also nadim bhai this is very interesting when he was employed as professor when he was designated as professor he was employed as professor on the basis of his promise not on the basis of his performance not on ap points but good thing is that after becoming a professor he produced some very important works he wrote on milton he wrote on shakespeare and today he is considered one of the very important one of the very important names actually in english culture so so the point here is that how was it possible for sayed mahmud and sir sayed ahmed khan to employ such people or tom or arnold for example so and many such people who were people of really class with and very good people very accomplished people even by british standards naturally they had to be paid more naturally they had to be paid more and at that time college also did not have uh, say very say good financial condition so that means the fees was also pretty steep and was when the fees was steep many people belonging to the lower classes automatically could not so think about getting admission but as far as the doors of the college was concerned they were not they were open to everyone whether uh, hindus or whether people who belong to the lower classes for everyone but since uh, there were uh, certain reasons of course the fees was steep so many of the poor people would have felt deprived but there was no discrimination as such but yes we cannot uh, hold a brief for sir sayed ahmed khan for many of those remarks which were made by him uh, well uh, i mean i would uh, add to what professor siddiq just said uh, i won't wish away the uh, negatives of sir sayed ahmed khan uh, but would also try to qualify by pointing out what uh, Asim Siddiqui sir pointed out when he started this lecture, and what I also pointed out at the time when 
I was introducing the topic and that is that let us not forget the time period when Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan existed. We are talking about a man who was living during the 18th century, much before the coming of the modern ideas. Let us also not forget that the man belonged to that section of the society uh, in uh, which, in fact, was the elite society. His, uh, you know, uh, relatives, all the, I mean, his uh, father, grandfather, they were all courtiers, members of the Mughal court. Sasiyat belonged to the Ashraf category. And very categorically, I would say that the Ajlaf were never considered by Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan to that extent uh, as he was soft towards the children of the elite. The MAO college was basically meant for the elite Muslims, those who belong to the Zamidar class and those who had been deprived by the government of India after the revolt of 1850. He was not concerned, I'm sorry to say, about the other Muslims. Uh, yes, we keep on citing that. I also said that he was taking chanda from everyone. But what I forgot to tell you at that moment of time that, for example, the chanda taken from the prostitutes was never used to construct, you know, uh, one of the main buildings of the college. I remember when uh, during my father's lifetime, when I was living in the university quarters, it was an old uh, building uh, of 19th century in which we were living, at a distance from them, there were a series of toilets, public toilets. And those toilets had been made with the contributions taken by Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan from the prostitutes. Uh, remember that uh, uh, for the elite students who were coming to Aligarh, the uh, main uh, hostel mein rehte the, unke paas mein there was a hostel which was in a way stable as well as the hostel for the size. Morrison Court. Uh, Morrison Court. <laughs> the intake of the Pasmanda, which as we understand it today, is something which started in the university, the admissions in a proper sense of the term, only from late 70s and early 80s. Uske pehle, humara jo aligra ka culture tha, wo dominated by the Shurofa culture, jo ek tendency but uh, you know, for a man who belonged to the 18th century, to him that was not wrong. I mean, uh, for example, during uh, the 14th century, when Zia Barni was writing his Tarikh Pero Shahi, uh, which incidentally uh, Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan also in a edited. Edited. Uh, edited, yeah. So, uh, uh, you know, Zia Barney's in, in Zia Barney's imagination, the common people never existed. They were not there at all. When the elites of Delhi were transferred to Dawlatabad, Zia Barney wrote that there Iran. There was a flourishing city. In fact, a city this was a word for an additional city. But Zia Barney is saying that it was all we ran because the common people, the non-Shurafa, 
वर नॉट ट्रीटिन लेट एस रिमेम्बर अगर आप आजकल के जो प्रिडिलेक्शन तो उनको पीछे मत ले जाइए और पीछे की जो प्रॉब्लम्स हैं आ, उनको आज की नजर से मत देखिए दैट इज वन ऑफ द थिंग्स लाइक टू से अमना लतीफ सेज वी हैव टू लुक एट सर सैयद अहमद खान पर्सनालिटी हिज कंट्रीब्यूशन हिज आइडियाज विद इन द टाइम एंड स्पेस टू अंडरस्टैंड दिस इज स्टैंड्स ऑन वुमेन एंड माइनॉरिटी शी हैज अ पॉइंट you know when uh, uh, asim saab just pointed out that uh, sir sayed was in fact i mean we find him wanting as far as female education was concerned but let us remember two things the works which have been done by certain historians from my department and elsewhere on this particular issue one thing which has come out with clarity is that the in the initial phase Sir Syed was not very very averse to the female education. In fact, there are statements of Sir Syed Ahmed Khan where he talks about equality of education to both males and females. Hmm. He is in favor of uh, education to both these sexes, but ultimately, when he is very near. uh to uh, see his dreams come true when mao college is now being established the sayed suddenly loses heart why possibly one of the reasons which i mean wo aadmi jo baat kar raha ho ke dono us period mein 18th century mein the aurat aur mard dono ko taaleem milna chahiye suddenly we find uh, we find him very cold towards the women education uh, we find like asim saab said uh, that uh, women should get education at home apne ghar mein padhe and there is a statement of sir sayed during that period of time when someone asked him ke aap ladkiyon ko kyun nahi admission de rahe hain to he points out kare hamare bachche jo hain ladke jo hain jab taaleem yafta ho jayenge तो वो अपनी बहनों को माओ को सबको सिखा दे विल एजुकेट देर वाइफ सिस्टर्स एंड डॉटर्स तो नीड इज द मेल एजुकेशन दैट इज हाउ ही डजेंट से दैट दे डोंट नीड एजुकेशन ही जस्ट सेस कि नहीं 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 वो बाद में हो जाएगा द क्वेश्चन विच आई वॉज पॉन्डरिंग ऑन दिस वाई दिस सडन चेंज इन सैयद एटीट्यूड टूवर्ड्स फीमेल एजुकेशन i might be wrong i have not worked on sasiyat at all uh, my my field uh, is medieval india lekin sasiyat ke institution mein rehta hu to thodi bahut mere samne bhi mere aankhon ke samne bhi sasiyat ki writings aati hain jo bhi maine samajhne ki koshish ki whatever i have understood i am just i might be totally wrong but my belief in this matter is that at a time when sasiyat was uh you know uh, uh founding his college there was an intense opposition to him that's right there were fatwas by very important that's uh, right ulama theologians given against him ek do nahi there were hundreds of fatwas mak sharif makkah se bhi fatwa bichare sir sayed ahmed khan ke khilaf manga liya tha ke that he is a kafir i mean uh, there were even cartoons uh, made uh, with sir sayed as the villain as the satan uh, uh, around his body there are snakes which are going to uh, you know like him is going to hell mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i think by just two points here can be added mm-hmm. i mean again taking lesson from the present see for example we are living in the period of social media see just one or two bad remarks if they are made against us we are upset now let us just 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 think about this time when uh, so many formal protests are made against him fatwas are issued against him entire groups of people are against him so naturally if he face this kind of odd so sometimes he was often guided by this reaction and maybe he did not take many decisions which otherwise he could have taken one 
and another important thing is that when he visited england and he when he met many educated english women there and when he met many english women in india also unlike many of his contemporaries see for example unlike samiulla unlike uh, uh, say mehndi muslim mulk sir said that but khan was full of praise for those liberated english women now it was an unusual thing many people in india they called those liberated english women they in fact looked at them with suspicion they criticized their culture they used bad names to describe them but sir said ahmed khan was able to praise them he was looking at them with open eyes so that is also one very important aspect that uh, he was not creating this false east and west binary where east is the land of spirituality and west is the land of liberalism but very which has a degenerate kind of culture he was not creating this binary so that's why he was able to praise many of those liberated english women also yes and yes and then ultimately when the uh, you know movement for the establishment of a girls college was started by Sheikh Abdullah, that Kashmiri Pandit convert, uh, who founded Papa Mia and Alabi, who founded the girls' uh, uh, school at Aligarh. Uh, Sir Syed, in fact, and, and number one never opposed him, and number two, yes. uh, in fact, uh, goaded him to go ahead and do his work. So, I mean, let, let us look at things uh, in context. A, uh, yeah, in, in a particular context. Shahid, my own belief is, as uh, Asim, you have worked on him, that uh, had he allowed at that particular of time when there was a vehement protest against him, that's right. Had he allowed uh, the girls entry into his college, I think the whole movement would have fallen. Uh, the M A O college fact, would not have been able to. In fact, it. even even in fact, even Papa Mia, for example. Yes. say when he when he was able to convince everyone that there will be proper arrangement of parda in the college only then parents started sending girls to the girls school so that means parda was an important issue for sir sayed right and um, uh, before i answer that earlier question which i said i would answer later on there is a question by sajjad dar which is an important question असलम आसिम साहब ये आपकी तरफ है आई डोंट हैव द बुक एट द मोमेंट बट आई थिंक शाफे साहब विल बी हियर इन वन ऑफ द प्रोग्राम सो यू लास्क हिम आई डोंट हैव द बुक एट द मोमेंट नेशनल कांग्रेस सॉफ्टन आफ्टर 18 दैट इज ट्रू या ही हैज रिटन दिस बट एट द मोमेंट आई डोंट हैव द बुक आई हैव टू से सी दैट पेज नंबर बट सर्टेनली इट इज देयर या Uh, but Sajad Dar, uh, you being a student of history, and a very good student of history in our department, and uh, uh, the department would uh, remember you uh, for a number of years for being a good student. Uh, uh, you should remember uh, the time uh, when uh, um, Sajad was. in fact uh, opposing indian national congress uh, hume had established indian national congress in 1885 and from that period down to the period when ultimately mahatma gandhi entered into the scene what was congress an elitist group unconcerned with the general public of india they were not fighting for india's independence also they were collaborators let me say hmm. hume had in fact jaise hota na pressure cooker mein se steam nikalne ke liye he had formed this group of the elite uh, you know indians all high caste rich Um, money people, um, and that is why Sir Syed Ahmed Khan very contemptuously is 
referring to them as bengali babus he never never ever even at the time when he was whether he ultimately becomes soft or he doesn't become soft he never ever talks about the fact that indian national congress was a hindu party he never talks uh, in in those terms at all he only opposes because he finds it to be a party of the bengali babus dozane mein jo paise wale adhatiya that type of uh, people zahir uh, who doesn't know uh, the type of politics which was being uh, played at that time who doesn't know about uh, the hindu iconography which was being added to the indian national movement also during that period of time before mahatma gandhi even after mahatma gandhi so uh, and we are talking about the period of sayyid ahmed khan which is much before that so uh, so i i don't think there is any any anything which uh, uh, makes a sayyid a suspect he is not uh, talking in terms of the two communities hindus and muslims at all uh, and as asim saab says that uh, uh, within a few be- a weeks um, uh, shafi saab would be here in one of the uh, saturdays and uh, uh, please do put up this question to him and uh, he would be better placed to answer it but the uh, page number uh, even he left to look up <laughs> but <laughs> uh, um, there is a question by uh, mohammad hasin ahmed being a hard boiled rationalist how far he has been successful in reconciling with the rampant and dominant islamic orthodoxy of the concurrent pre independence era and his anglophile profile was despised by most of the muftis of that time i wonder how he was juggling through these tight ropes i think we have been discussing this point uh we have been discussing this point that uh, sir sayed ahmed khan faced those fatwas very stiff opposition but he also was a man of convictions say for example when he talked about his rationalism with reference to religion he faced very stiff opposition and why go to his times has his tafsir been published after his death so are we any better no so he faced that opposition very stiff opposition but uh, he was a man of conviction but he was also a man of pragmatism so he was doing what he wanted to he established the college and wherever he wanted to take uh, a kind of pragmatic route he took that route established the college but uh, he also stayed away from many things so for example he was not part of the theology department he never imposed his own views he had those views about islam but when theology was a subject in the college he never imposed his views so he was very careful also that uh, he held to his views he held to his convictions but uh, he did not want to burden others with his views Uh, not only that he didn't uh, i mean uh, impose his views on the theology department uh, 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 in fact what we find is that uh, he tried to hand over the reins of the theology department to a very well known theologian of that time yeah. whom he personally wrote a letter and invited him to come and take up the assignment yes and what did that theologian write back to sir sayed he wrote back ke aap kya agar in your institution if uh, shias and sunnis uh, both uh, are given equal status they have, then i have nothing to do how does sir sayed then retaliate to that he said no problems i don't need you and he saw to it that two distinct uh you know departments under the faculty were established the sunni theology as well as the shia theology 
so uh, uh, in fact nadim bhai uh, just a question to you do you think that uh, this is very much a legacy of sir syed ahmed khan that uh, in aligarh shias and sunnis often offer prayer in the same mosque and sometimes together also something which is uh, not very common in india yes, it is a legacy of sir syed ahmed khan because you know mm. uh, there were certain uh, nawabs uh, from the hyderabad side uh, who had uh, given chanda for the construction of a shia uh, mosque separate from the sunni one uh, uh, sir syed took up the offer took up uh, the chanda uh but saw to it that all those who were students in the college would be praying in the same mosque yes so in fact uh, you know uh, after akbar the credit of all muslims praying together in one mosque uh, goes to uh, uh, sir sayyid ahmed that now, is this, remarkable yeah yeah that is remarkable so the fact that shia theology and sunni theology were established together with equal right in the same building same place uh, instead of two mosques only uh, one mosque where both were asked to be equal partners hmm? so that is something which this is remarkable for say yes which we should remember this is remarkable and since i come from bareilly where even sunnis cannot to visit in the same mosque this in fact <laughs> takes me back to answering the question of from where did sir sayyed ahmed khan derive his rationalistic ideas it was not from europe the dikhi sahab has pointed out that there is hardly any, any evidence of this right. reading any of those people out there but we have any evidence to say that sir sayyed when he got his traditional education he was brought up in the mogal tradition just like raja ram mohan roy had been hmm. both the persons whether it was raja ram mohan roy of bengal renaissance or sir sayyed ahmed khan both of them were educated in the mogal way of life and what was that mogal way of life it was a way of life which had been in fact influenced to a high degree by the policy of sulhakul of akbar the same elements tolerance of all equal distance between all religions not being a part of it but giving credence to all faiths together hmm. translating works so that one may understand the other hmm. all the, those projects which had once been initiated by akbar or followed by darashiko in fact even the strict rule of aurangzeb had uh, was uh, such that uh, those uh, views could not be washed away because we find those policies continuing in the latter mughal period whether it was the reign of muhammad shah or in fact even bahadur shah zafar the court which um uh, mm, uh, mm, uh, sir sayyed ahmed khan father served those were the ideas which uh, these rationalistic aql versus naql i mean this is what sir sayyed is doing emphasis on naql rationalism science subjects which were included by akbar in the uh, course curriculums of his period and questioning you about blind following questioning even your religious texts through rationalism hmm. that was the philosophy which had been established in india from uh, uh, you know uh, at the period of the moguls onwards the fact that sir sayyed is open to technology he gave you example about how he accepted type setting and uh, the uh, markings on the movable type yeah movable yeah. type movable type and drag diacritics and so on and so forth 
Sir Sayyid is not averse to any of them. Once again, a tradition which was established in the court in which he had his early learning. All those ideas, naturally they were tempered with the new ideas of the period when Sir Sayyid himself was. There was a new type of rationalism which was coming in. There was a question on Darwin. Yes, Sir Sayyid was very well aware about Darwinism. In fact, he was also under the influence of Darwinism and that became one of the butt of jokes against Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan because the cartoons which were made, they were titled, it, they, it was not written Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan. Yeah, the, title, the, the title under the cartoon was Sir Sayyid the Nature. So in fact, there was a continuity and an amalgamation of both the type of ideas uh, which uh, Sir Sayyid was carrying to them. Uh, they were the ideas of the 18th century. None of the ideas were perfect. Um, there were, uh, you know, many issues and problems with the thought of Sir Sayyid. But remember that he was experimenting. At least he was ready to question things at an age, at a point when none of them was, uh, you know, ready to challenge any of the views. Uh, 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 which were prevalent during that period of time. Uh, you, Hassan, uh, no man is perfect and Sir Sayyid was only a man. Although his contribution to the advancement of the community is immeasurable, let's not hold Sir Sayyid on a pedestal and turn a blind eye to all his shortcomings. Sure. No one does, sir. A balanced and objective critique is necessary for an accurate assessment an appraisal of Sir Sayyid or any other great person for that matter. Uh, you, Hassan Sahib, uh, you are very correct in pointing that out. And I would uh, direct you to one of the uh, video lectures which I have put up, uh, a lecture which was delivered by Professor Irfan Habib uh, in 2019, uh, uh, which deals with the evolution of Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan's thought. Uh, it, it deals, this lecture deals with all the warts and good points of Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan. Similarly, I would ask you uh, that there is one of the uh, very well-known Sir Sayyid scholars who had also been given an award by the Alibi Muslim University, David Lillivel. David Lillivel Kabi lecture is uploaded uh, on my channel. Again, you will find the same critical approach. Uh, there are certain people uh, related with uh, uh, Aliga Muslim University who are uh, trying to be very uncritical of Sarsayed. But there are people uh, who are working on Sarsayed related with Aliga who are looking at Sarsayed with a very critical approach. You are very correct to point out that a full comprehension, a real comprehension of a man can never take place until and unless we take both the points. And fortunately, uh, as far as modern scholarship is concerned, both the uh, uh, viewpoints, uh, good and bad, they are being taken into consideration. But let us remember when we come, uh, jump to conclusions, look here, this is what Sir Sayyid uh, did. Mm -hmm. Pay attention. What was the age in which, era in which he was living? What was the general thought of that period? And during that thought, what were the elements uh, uh, where Sir Sayyid was trying to bring about changes? So we do find that Sir Sayyid was a man of his age. There is no doubt about it. But then a man who was looking towards the future. And with these, uh, you know, um, uh, words, I think we have uh, uh, passed much time. I must thank uh, um, Asim Siddiqui for uh, bearing with us. Uh, there were a lot of questions uh, which probably were not 
answered. Uh, but I promise that there are a series of pledges which are going to follow as far as uh, Sasai Rehmat Khan is concerned. Uh, uh, there would be a number of questions. There was a question about the basic readings on Sasai Rehmat Khan. Uh, mm, uh, well, there are a number of good works which have been done. Uh, one of the uh, authors is, uh, you know, Lakshmi Kant uh, Misraji. Uh, Iftikar Ahmad Khan is one of the authors, but uh, unfortunately, he has written in Urdu one of the remarkable works uh, on Sir Sayyid, but all his works are in Urdu. Uh, so Cam I would Cambridge, Cam Cambridge Companion is good that way. Cambridge yes, Companion is good. Shan Muhammad's volumes are good. Shafiq Kadwai's new book is good. So there are uh, many writings. We will be bringing Shafiq Kadwai, whose book has just come out on the Sayyid Ahmad Khan. Uh, so there is much material. You just Google search for it. There is much material which you would find on Sir Sayyid. I would just end uh, whatever we are discussing. Uh, by, uh, you know, um, pointing out that next week, uh, we have had a lecture on Akbar last week. Today we discuss Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, some aspect of that. He's such a personality that everything cannot be covered in such a short time. Uh, next week, we have Professor Purshottam Agarwal who would be talking to us about Gandhi and possibly he would also be dealing something with appraising Mahatma Gandhi during the 21st century. His wordings might be different but this is what I expect they, that he would be uh, speaking about. I once again thank every one of you. Meet you 7 p.m. Saturday next week. Thank you. Everyone.